Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Energy Newsbeat Podcast. Today is a fantastic day. The world needs all the unlimited power that we can possibly get, but we also need it at net zero or the ability to not pollute the planet. And today I have a fabulous guest today. Today I have Priyanka Ford. She is the founder of Chronos Fusion Energy. Welcome. How are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me, Stuart. Uh, now, you're calling from the south of France. Is that correct? Yes, I'm here for another week. Uh, I'm at Eater. And and what are you doing there? Um, uh, Should I say what Eater is? Eater is a fusion energy experiment that's built by 35 countries put a, pulling resources together. It was started back in the day with the Ronald Reagan uh, during the Cold War. But... but I am at the first ever public-private conference at ITER. So it took a few years. Yeah. How cool is that? Now, I get excited because people get a little confused on fusion and, and fission. And fusion is putting the molecules together, and fission is splitting them apart. Fission has been around for a long time. And how many years? Let's start, though, with Kronos and say, how did you get started and create Kronos Fusion Energy? Okay, so fusion, uh, in terms of physics and scientific breakthroughs, actually predates fission. And few like the like in the Oppenheimer movie, they kind of talked about how they were fusion breakthroughs right. that then later led to to fission. So, but there was fission was easier to do a science, like from an engineering and materials perspective than fusion. So we kind of put that on the back burner. For Kronos, we've been officially around for about two years. Okay. I have worked on fusion energy for the last, I want to say, six to seven years. I took it more seriously. But, you know, I've been a fan of fusion my whole life. It felt like something that I would be promised as an adult. And, uh, <clears throat> and you know, I, I wanted to see it happen. So I don't quite have an origin date on it. <laughs> <laughs> so if, if with your company and and taking a look at Kronos, how many years because I want to get you and Elon together on a podcast and let's talk about space travel because you know let's go through the steps of where you are now and how do we get to Elon and space travel? Um how do we get to Elon space travel? I see. Okay. So right now fusion is an engineering and materials challenge. It still it still is. So so we've had a few breakthroughs where the physics and the mathematics proves out. We can throw in some AI in there and optimize expedite etc. But for the most part it's an engineering challenge and it requires it, it requires it requires quite a few material breakthroughs shall we say. And hopefully okay. AI is a part of that as well. For it to go for it to be space ready it depends on the type of fusion that you're looking at. If you're looking at a type of fusion, like you can have, you can achieve fusion through about four or five different methodologies. And okay. there are, I want to say about eight to 10 different fuels that can be used for fusion, mostly hydrogen isotopes. And you can use them in different permutations and combinations that give you different outputs. So some of these fuels like deuterium and tritium, which is conventional fusion fuel, has a lot of neutrons that comes out of this process. Okay. Now, what we're shooting for is something called a neutronic, which is harder to fuse. So we're going after fusing helium-3, which is harder to fuse. However, you could surpass this, your traditional heat cycles, and you could go from to direct energy conversion, where you pretty much convert protons to electricity. And that can be achieved through a neutronic fusion. The big okay. problem with a neutronic is that especially the one the 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 generator we're going after at Kronos is that it requires huge amounts of helium 3. Now helium 3 is very rare on earth however it's absolutely abundant on the moon. So wow. 
Um, and <laughs> we, we're actually working with a company that's going to fetch us helium-3 from the moon. So there's there's a plan for this. It'll take them about five years to do so. So that kind of goes in with our eight-year timeline for our product. So but, I would say if I were to say, when can I build this moon thing? About 25 to 30 years. Okay. Yeah. Now, now, to get from A to B... You had mentioned, and on your website and your video that we'll be playing some of the clips in, commercial heat. And when we had just talked before the show, it's critical because people forget that emissions come from cement, making cement. And a Kronos reactor to get before you get there could be used in that event. Is that correct? Yeah, and making and, cement. And, uh, yes, and so that that's the first kind of product that w- that we want to roll into market. That's our first deliverable to the marketplace. Would be a heat heat generation unit. Nice. I we feel in terms of technological readiness, there's quite a bit of uh-huh. research that needs to be done on actual electricity generation, but the physics and the engineering is is close to readiness when it comes to heat generation. So in this first couple of stages, uh, Priyanka, that we're really looking at what kind of fuel are you still going to need the hydrogen three or what kind of fuel can you use in these reactors? So for us, we're still looking at helium three, but the way that these fuels Usually, it's it's a combination between deuterium, tritium, or helium-3. And the first generation fu- fusion energy fuels that are out there are going to be deuterium and tritium because fundamentally, they're easier to fuse, meaning they don't repel each other that much. And if you can build a strong enough magnet and create a plasma field, you can fuse deuterium and tritium. It's a little bit easier. So a lot of the research that's been nice. done over the last 50 years or so has been around deuterium and tritium. However, tritium is, is the hydrogen isotope that goes into making hydrogen bombs. And so it's a little bit of a volatile substance. And right. for you to start using that in large scale commercialization, you would hit into you would hit a lot of regulatory, you know, roadblocks. Right. So, you know, you it'd be questionable where and where you can build it. And right. then you still have this possibility of if you were to run your generator at a steady state and you had neutrons ex- escaping, now you have neutrons in your neighborhood. And that's not so much better than fission. So we're just going back in that loop. So what we decided to do was go completely a neutronic. Now, the problem with a neutronic is that it's almost three times harder to fuse than deuterium and tritium. So a neutronic fuels are helium-3. Other fully a neutronic fuels are like Right. Uh, boron, you know, things there, there's some other elements. But so what we chose with helium three, the challenge is that we have to build a magnet that's three times stronger, which we have a design and patent for. However, right. once you achieve that and you're able to fuse helium three, there are no neutrons from the output. So it is as clean as can be. It's it's cleaner than than regular fusion. And so you can put it in different neighborhoods and you're not using tritium and helium 3 is is you know it dissolves in water there's absolutely no harm in it. So it it right. it you know so anyway. So we we it's call we're calling it more advanced. I mean we as an industry in fusion energy we call the neutronic fuels as advanced fuels. Well that's yeah. pretty cool. Now, how does so your fuel sources that you use, like thorium or other reactors, they can use? You know, it depends on on what source. I'm trying to get my question in here. Getting the raw materials is going to be tough. Um, depends. Yeah. So that that's something that we thought about. That's that's what I'm doing out here actually this week. I'm I'm trying to shore up our supply chains and manufacturing. Nice. Um, so what what we thought? Yeah. So were you to have neutrons produce in your system, then your material costs go up exponentially. Right. However, if you don't have neutrons in your system, your magnet costs go up. However, your material costs go down. So there is a win-lose in, in whichever one you hmm. pick. However, 
overall, when you look at the overall cost system, which we have done, when we look at the overall level of cost of energy and depending on which formula you use, right. um, regardless of, actually, I should have said, regardless of which levelized cost of energy formula you use, you still end up with a net positive in terms of cost when you go a neutronic fuel. So it's, it's almost cheaper to build a more productive magnet than a stronger material. Which so, it, it, that does make sense. I like that. The business model for Kronos, Fusion Energy, I'm, are you looking at growing? How are you growing your funding? Because this is going to be a a very large project, correct? Right. So we, we have taken an approach where we're building digital twins. So we're building simulations for all of the different parts of our fusion energy generator. So we're, oh, we're going the, you know, measure twice and build one's way of doing things. And okay. also we are trying to partner with other companies to build as many different components as possible so that we can not only kind of like spread spread the work around, but we can get more people into the ecosystem for fusion and having that kind of parallel processing of building expedites nice. our timelines as well. The problem with that is you need to have, you know, because this is a complicated device with like very small tolerances. Right. So you need to have a very, you need to have a perfect design. So this is where we're leveraging a lot of AI and machine learning to get right. to those tolerances and that perfect design. And then we dole out the work to, and get as many folks involved as possible. So we're trying not, we're trying not to do everything ourselves. Actually, we're trying to do as less as possible and try to get other folks in. But in terms of funding, we've raised two rounds so far. Nice. We have what we need in order to finish the research we're working on. Once we start building, I guess, yeah, that will require large infusions of money. And so, I don't know, we'll have to see what happens. An IPO is a way to go, but also it's not really bad to be in fusion these days. Like the, the funding is flowing pretty well, like like never before. Right. The, the resurgence on just overall nuclear is here. And, right. and, and AI is effectively, AI and insurance companies have effectively killed the energy transition. The, there will be no net zero without natural gas or nuclear. And we've got to have nuclear in order to just provide the data centers in order to do the AI. So, you know, and insurance companies are are doubling their insurance on EVs and because of the, the batteries and the storage problems and all that kind of stuff. So we need all forms of energy and we really need nuclear. So, yeah, I'm really with you on that one. We, I think it, it's going to take a little bit of everything. Yeah. Yeah, I'm. I, you know, it sounds kind of awful, but I'm. I'm really energy agnostic. I could care less if it's wind, solar, nuclear, oil and gas, as long as it is the least impact on the environment and sustainable through fiscal responsibility. So you you start doing the math on this, and it kind of leaves out subsidies. Now, if nuclear has been around for so long, it is phenomenally a resilient platform once it's built in order to get rolling. And I understand the investment we have to do up front. And that's why fusion is so important to get done right now. And I love your thought process, Priyanka. This is pretty cool. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, we're very, very supportive of nuclear as well in, in, in any form. Actually, our whole heat extraction unit for our fusion generator is being built by a fission company because they have existing technology to do these things. So having that convergence is pretty good. The other thing, I was at COP28 in December last year. Um, I'm sure you know what that is. Um, oh, yeah. So I was at COP28 and one of the things that I talked, uh, it was out in Dubai. So one of the things that I talked about a lot was using fusion energy, industrial heat for liquid fuel production. So like yes. we learned that oil and gas, it takes up about 25% of the fuel that we dig up to process the other 75%. So if we okay. replace that with some industrial heat, it would, we could also be doing, we could be helping out the 
oil industry and making them slightly cleaner because oil's not going to go anywhere. No, um, it, it, it's hard to make, you know, pharmaceutical or plastics from windmills or something like that. Right. I interview, I had the fortune of interviewing Grace Stanky, who is Miss America. She was at COP28 and I interviewed her live from Dubai and she was talking about the UAE's new fission reactors there. And I, I am very, very proud of the UAE for providing so much of their power by their nuclear reactors. That was pretty cool. Yeah, they're they're very motivated about fusion as well. One of my one of my roommates from college from my business school is the minister of investments at UAE and oh, cool. he He's he's also like I think the CEO of their nuclear nuclear program. So he talked a lot about fusion because I think John Kerry at COP28 declared a global strat. I don't know why they picked him as like the spokesperson, but I don't understand politics. So he, nevertheless, yeah. he he put together like a global fusion energy commercialization strategy when he was there, like COP28 this time around. That was interesting. Yeah, we were all in the crowd and having worked on it for so long, it was interesting to see fusion reaching that that stage. I'm not sure that he would be a good one to name for something like that. He's got a lot of negative name baggage. I, I would prefer someone new to carry the charge forward. To be honest with you, I think Fusion has a lot of, lot of great things going for it. And he has a lot of, he's a magnet for negativity, if you would. <laughs> but yeah, I remember him running for president when I was in high school. And then I don't, I haven't heard from him at all. And then I saw him there. So yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know about that one. Uh, it, it's kind of sad. And I, I think, and so when you take a look at, let's see, a new up and coming star for nuclear or somebody with baggage, let's go with something new so that we can get this new technology moving forward is my opinion but yeah but you know politicians like they're gonna like i i kind of saw it coming like today there is there's a thing so america has a decadal plan for fusion energy commercialization and in like two hours there's a white house conference of them reporting like two years into this like what has been done oh yeah the like the conference is happening under one political administration, but fusion energy was started under a whole other political administration. Right. And there have been a lot of people in between in terms of leaders from both sides that have, you know, funded it. But it it almost feels like whoever's going to be the leader when the breakthroughs happen is going to take credit for it all. <laughs> like, despite like 60 Isn't years of work, he's going to be like, I did it. I, the internet, like, you know, I, I, I invented the internet. No, and, and then how funny is that? But, you know, you sit back and we take a look at, you're right, because China looks at 100 year blocks. And the US, we look at two year blocks. When's the next election coming? Mm -hmm. And it's so short sighted. Let's look for long term energy policies that gets rid of energy poverty, does the best on the environment and is sustainable. And I think the world would be better off. I'm with you. I learned a lot about what China is doing in fusion this last week because it cool. was one of the, you know, there was a Chinese company that presented their work. And I think I think that everybody was a little shocked by how ahead of the game they were. For me specifically, I saw that, you know, as I mentioned, there, there are different types of fusion and different companies are pursuing different types of fusion with different fuels or whatever. Right. But China specifically is going after helium-3, a neutronic magnetic confinement. And when I talk, and that's exactly what our design is at Kronos, right? And so, wow. um, and and I think of of. of the motivation behind my choice of the design was an economic one. I wanted to design a generator that could be produced at the rate of 500 generators per year uh, at some right. point, you know, maybe a decade or two from now. But my goal was to design a thing that was scalable and, you know, the materials were available, etc. And the fact that they are putting all of their eggs into that basket I felt what? there was a part of me that was like, hey, good for fusion energy. But there's another part of me that was like, 
oh, come on, man. Like, <laughs> well, there's there's two things. What validation? This is huge. Well, yeah, you should fair. you should be very proud of what your design and your forward thinking is. Stuart, they have 40,000 engineers working in one facility. We're 58, man. (laughs) (laughs) But, you know, Um, now I wonder, you know, has espionage, has all your plans been stolen or sold? Oh, no, 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 not at all. I think that, I think, you know, so China was part of Eater. It was part of the original seven companies. And the whole... Uh, countries, I mean, and the whole idea behind Eater and the reason it was, you know, it, it kind of came to be during the Cold War with Russia was right. was to have one project that U.S. and Russia could work on in order to retain an ongoing conversation. And they right. chose fusion energy. And so I think we're, I, I don't know, but I want to say we're in a bit of a Cold War with China. And I think... Competition is a good thing, you know, bring it. Let's see. I am so happy for you, though, because as a founder and so involved taking Kronos and Effusion Energy to the next level, what a validation. Right. Yeah, it was a bit of a motivation as well, because... I was told that, hey, these you're talking about advanced fuel, so you're talking about a decade away, and then I see that it's actually being done now, and it almost makes me feel like maybe I should be hurrying up. Well, let me ask this, and, and, and China just has far side of the moon flags and a landing that they did, so do you think they're going to be first to get into the H3? Um, yeah, I think it's part of their strategy, that that 100 year strategy. And and we have our own plans, too, in America. Um, Good. But let's get but, let's get Elon on the phone here. Let's get his. Let's get his, his number. I, yeah, I, I don't either. But I, let's let's talk to him because I, I would rather have us, you, Priyanka Ford and Kronos Fusion Energy be there before them. Um. Yeah. Hey, I'm here for it. Uh, <laughs> need some money and support. Yeah. Um, you, so I heard at Eater that Elon visited about a month and a half ago. Somebody okay. like the coffee lady told me. Uh, right. Yeah. So it's in his radar. Nice. You know, it's, it's like all of the big guys are invested in fusion. Like Bill Gates is like the number one investor in Commonwealth Fusion. I think they raised $1.8 billion two years ago, and that was a Bill Gates round. And then Jeff Bezos is the main investor in, I want to say, General Fusion that's in Canada. And there are a few others. Sam Altman, obviously Helion Energy is is Sam Altman. Yeah. So, well, th- this is exciting. And I, I would like to stay in touch with you on getting updates out. And I'd like to look at this podcast as the first of several as we get future events or things coming from you. I'd like to have you back and give us updates because I know that our listeners are very much want to know how fast we can get there. And if we've got fusion reactor heat things that can come out, heat products that can make a cement and or other business processes. Let's take a look at the deindustrialization of Germany right now but with a loss of Russian natural gas. Yep. Kronos fusion energy modules could replace that and get them back on their feet. Man, Germ- Germany is, is, is on it. Like they're on it. There were Three fusion energy startups that popped up in Germany over the last year and a half, and all three nice. of them have been fully funded. And wow. uh, the Max Planck Institute in in Germany has has like sixty years of fusion energy research. We we even got data from those guys. They're so open and open to sharing. Nice. Uh, yeah. But. But the deindustrialization going on from the net zero folks is real, and it needs to be counteracted by having a lots of energy going on so that we can go to this energy to keep industry going to pay, but yet not impact the environment. So it's a it's a vicious cycle that's going on. Yeah. <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah, I'm with you 100. percent I'm with you on that one. Well, fantastic. Well, I want you to have a, a a fantastic trip, and people can find you on LinkedIn. We'll have your LinkedIn information there, and Kronos Fusion Energy website will also be in there. Is there anything else, or anything else in the last minute that we have here? Any other thoughts? Uh, not at all. Just look into Fusion Energy. Get involved. Tell your children. Yep, that's about it. <laughs> Well, fantastic. Well, I hope you enjoy the rest of your great trip in, in Italy there. And I look forward to visiting with you again. Thank you for your time. You too. Thank you, Stuart. All right. Talk to you soon.